morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out to hear a couple of words. Um, the topic of revolution was an interesting one to be given. And you know, whilst I went through a myriad of thoughts in terms of what I could talk about, and the list became quite long, uh, at the end it was actually quite simple because, well, as one of the designers said, all they want to see is case studies. All they want to see is design work. And I thought, eh, it's a bit boring. I don't really re like talking about work in that context because it feels a bit repetitive. But to kind of keep him happy and in the context of the theme, I thought, well, actually, what I'd like to do is talk about a revolutionary approach to some of our work or how we've actually tackled it in a really different way. Because really, the best things we do are based on challenge. They're based on having a look at where an opportunity lies and then flipping it on its head. The other thing I really wanted to talk about, which was important to me, was the revolution that should exist in all of you. The revolution that you can create within yourself. Basically, the way that you can think about what it is that you do, how you do it, and how you can do it, not just to be a better designer, but actually just be a happier person. To actually do stuff in a way that makes you feel I'm really joyful about the way I'm approaching my career, the way I'm approaching my life, and what I'm getting back. And only you can do that to achieve that outcome. Um, interestingly, one of the dumbass things that I did do when I first got the topic and thought about it, I thought, well, if I really immersed myself in this idea, I could be a smart ass and do the opposite. Because that's revolutionary, right? And then I realized, actually, it's not. It's quite dumb. It's not revolutionary at all. It's just trying to be uh, someone who sort of challenges and does the opposite for no very good reason. For me, the idea of revolution is to have purpose. For me, the idea is to actually change perception, is, is to think about what is the meaning behind this? And rather than sort of just doing it for the sake of it, actually having a really clear understanding of your goal. And often that goal means doing the opposite of expectation, but only because the criteria warrants it. I thought I'd start by taking you through a couple of examples of this. Um, one of our clients, Great Dane Furniture, who make beautiful furniture, it's all very expensive. Uh, they have had challenges in recent years with a lot of the sort of copycat uh, manufacturers who literally charge about 80 or 90% less than they do uh, to make these replicas. So for them it was, this idea of how do we actually position ourselves to engage people. Now, they had a bunch of incredible furniture and I went through their catalogue and I picked out a number of pieces and asked, how well does this sell? Now, this chair is called the Spanish chair. It retails for about $6,000. And they said, we can't sell any. No one buys this chair. And I said, wow, it is amazing. I love this chair. And I said, why don't people buy it? Let's put the price aside. And he said, well, it's kind of heavy and it's big and it's solid and, you know, uh, people just haven't really kind of connected with it. And so as one of the sort of products that I said, okay, well, in our campaign, let's relook at it. This big, heavy chair, how can we make it light? How can we do the opposite? How can we find the problems and mitigate them by challenging the perception of actually flipping it on its head? Let's make it float. Let's make it theatrical. Let's make it artful. So there's a reason that this is a $6,000 chair and not a $250 one, because it's authentic. It's got meaning, it's got substance. And for me, when you actually take something and you put it in the context of art or theater, you change the way people will actually engage with it. So for me, it was really about you know, making something that was gonna attract, stop, and engage people. And so we took that thinking uh, to a range of products like this $2,500 Kai dining chair, um, which obviously with CGI we had the ability to uh, stack up 100 of them because he certainly wasn't going to let me do it in a photo shoot. No doubt they would have all fallen down and that would have been you know, the $200,000 diabolical photo shoot. <laughs> but it's just an example of looking at things in a very different way. And for me, from a creative point of view, that in and of itself is revolution. One of my biggest clients for about a decade actually uh, was Foster's CUB. We did about 35 brands for them. And I was always really excited to invent new brands and create something that didn't exist in the market. But getting that through was near impossible. The challenges that you faced to convince layer upon layer of management to even look or think about a new idea. 
So when we went through this idea of uh, inventing and creating a new product for a category at that point that never existed called low-carb beer, pretty much 99% of the people I spoke to said it was a terrible idea, that the market wasn't interested, that they'd only perceive it as light beer, low alcohol, and it really wouldn't work. Now, this wasn't you know, some incredible brainstorm from our point of view that we thought, let's just come up with it. It was from very logical thinking. And that thinking came from two ideas. One was that if you look at the influence of what was happening in the food category and just general lifestyle, two things predominated. The first one was health, that people actually wanted a healthier lifestyle. They wanted to make healthier choices. And the second one was premiumization, that they actually wanted to buy things that felt like they cost more, they looked like they were better or worth more, but they didn't really want to pay more money. So you had to have sort of an everyday offer that looked better. It was the Stella Artois at a VB price. So our solution, uh, working with the client, was Pure Blonde. Now, when we launched that, uh, I literally had people all across the client saying to me, this job will be the death of you. It will fail so badly, it will ruin your reputation in this company. You may never work here again. That's how bad we think it's going to die. So you, sh you really shouldn't have pushed this so hard. Now, as you all now know, many, many years later, um, it's had huge success. Um, it uh, sells, it's the biggest low-carb beer, obviously, in Australia. Uh, last I checked, which was a number of years ago, it was selling in excess of $500 million a year worth of stock. Not sure what the number is today, but you get the drift. It was an idea that had meaning and purpose, and once you actually brought that to life in a market, without any marketing or advertising, people adopted it. In our business, uh, we do an enormous amount of property marketing. It's a sector that I love. I really love working with communities, precincts, placemaking, buildings, architects, interior designers, landscape designers. I love the fact that unlike some of the branding work we do, which might be strategy, identity, and rollout, in property, we're, doing, uh, we're actually working with the master planners, figuring out where parks go. We're actually helping brief the architects about what the building should look like. We're creating master plan in terms of what the opportunity for mixed use is, how do we engage community, um, what sort of product should come to life, uh, whether they should be townhouses or apartments or how much commercial should exist. Like we're not just doing the brochure. We are working with large organisations to change the face of suburbs in the most positive way. We're doing really exciting things that will have generational impact. You know, we go from conceptual positioning, ideation, naming, strategy, branding, identity, campaign concepts, uh, print collateral, digital collateral, sales and display suites, you name it. So it's pretty extensive and it's really exciting. But right now, if you look at the media, we're being told there's this big bubble. We're not, but anyway. It's interesting to kind of keep reading that while the market continues to go up. Now, there's a real formula to what happens in our sector. It's predominantly boring as batshit. Generally, what you see is an image, uh, you know, a logo, uh, sales agents information, and that's about it. You pretty much see that on 95% of stuff. For us, what we wanted to do was create a campaign that showed no product. Our campaign was all about the notion of what this project meant from an emotional point of view. We had this old Art Deco warehouse. We wanted to actually bring it to life with meaning uh, from a visual point of view and from messaging. We wanted to engage a very particular audience. The way we look at projects is that very rarely ever do we do something that is for everybody. Nothing is for everybody. If you think it's for everybody, you're either lazy or you actually don't really understand the brief or the opportunity. In this context, we knew that it wasn't for everybody. It was for, for a very niche audience. Now, it's actually in Redfern, but from my point of view, close enough to Surrey Hills that we can pretend. Um, <laughs> and we wanted to actually bring to life, you know, this sort of historical element of this Art Deco warehouse building and have a personality in terms of the way that we articulated the really clear benefits of its proximity, public transport, uh, parks, uh, rooftop. So all those things that property developers want to communicate, we just wanted to do it in the visual context of these Art Deco posters that we created in-house. Um, one of the things that I've really enjoyed in this job was the bottom of this is an article written by a dog. Uh, it really is. Well, 
maybe he didn't write it, but I helped him write it. One, and, and Lisa at work, and he, he was a bit messy with his handwriting, but we got there in the end. And what the dog had to say about this project from his point of view was he loved it because it was directly across the road from Prince Alfred Park, a great park. And you know, he was saying, look, this is great, love living here. Uh, every day I go to meet my bitches at the park. <laughs> now, the language was like that throughout this campaign. And when the client saw it, he almost shat himself. He was like, you can't do that. Now, you need to remember that when we work on these projects in property marketing, we could be marketing a project like this one, which is actually quite small, which when it sold in a day, netted the developer about 50 million. That's considered very small. We commonly do projects that uh, the gross realization is about four or 500 million. We're doing several projects around Australia that once they're sold, they will net over a billion. Last year, uh, the projects we did netted our clients over six billion. So we're talking about real money. And we're talking about really important projects that have a lot of risk and people are afraid to actually do something different. So in this case, and hopefully in lots of other projects we do, we convince clients not to take a risk because this is too big an amount of money to take a risk. It's about creating a very succinct strategy. And in the context of the, the client, they think it's revolutionary to do some of these things. But for us, it just makes good sense. We're differentiating, we're speaking directly to a very particular target audience, and we're engaging people in a way that none of our competitors are. So for us, doing things like this is really exciting. I have zero interest in doing the same old, same old as all of our competitors in this sector, because it doesn't excite me. And one of the most important things about your job is it has to excite you. If it doesn't excite you, get a new job. One of the things I wanted to talk about also was challenge in terms of the brief that you sometimes get from clients. Now, this was an interesting job because it was very cool and funky and it was for a great sort of small brand and, and cool bunch of people with hardly any money. And when I first went to them, I said, look, I really think your brand's not working. I know you just want us to do this small piece of work, but I think we need to actually start everything from scratch. Here's my plan, here's the process, here's the cost, what do you think? And I actually said, you're right, let's do it. Great. Now, um, I can't read the quote, I'm oh, sorry. The, the client said, after we'd presented two massive rounds of work, heap of creative solutions, he came back to me and he said, look, I apologise because you asked us if you could push the boundaries and challenge us. And we said yes. But, and I really feel that you've done that. But now, we've changed our mind. Now, this was a job probably only worth about $30,000 or $40,000. And in head hours, we had spent about $150,000. So we were dying. Now, any sort of commercial business just goes, cut your losses, walk away. But for me, it was about, no, I don't like walking away, and I'm going to persevere. And even though the client has completely changed the rules on me, and even though he's had a, a, an about face, and he wants to stick with what he's got, I'm not going to let him. I'm not going to let him off the hook. We're going to persevere until we get an outcome. So whilst at the time when this happened, I was feeling pretty frustra frustrated, but I think in the context of this notion of revolution, revolution is actually understanding when challenge hits you in the face and being able to just go at it regardless. Instead of going too hard, I've lost too much money, emotionally I'm distressed, I'm annoyed and angry, and I'm just gonna walk away. But in true revolutionary mindset, you go, you know what, no way, I'm gonna twist this around, I will find a solution, I'm gonna go at it. So we did persevere, it took about a year, I kid you not. And now we have a new brand identity for Chapelli Bicycles, um, uh, who are a great brand. In fact, all the Hoin team have a Chapelli Bicycle, because in fact, rather than take the money, I just said, give me $40,000 for the bikes. So everyone at Hoin now rides to Chapelli. Um, you know, and I, even though we had a lot of other ideas that I absolutely loved and I, I truly believed they were bang on, but the client at the end of the day went, no, I'm not going to go with that. So we had to go back again and again and again. I think I went through about six huge rounds of work to finally get there. But for me, this wasn't just about 
perseverance. It was about not giving up. And that's what revolution's about. It's about not giving up. Because if the notion of revolution is easy, it's not really revolution, it's just bullshit. It's just, you know, it's taking the easy way out. The true notion is actually to persevere. So it's hit the market. Um, you know, we're really, I can't wait to start seeing bikes going up and down the street with a logo. And all that bad stuff, it will be forgotten. It's in the past. Interestingly, when I think about the context of revolution, I started to think about organisations that I work with. And I've worked with a lot of not-for-profits over the last 24 years of my career. And there's an amazing organisation from the UK, uh, which was originally created by Alain de Botton, uh, called the School of Life. Some of you may have heard of it. It's actually the first uh, office they opened in the world. It's in Melbourne, of all places. I mean, I'm originally from Melbourne. I love Melbourne. Um, but to actually get these guys in Melbourne to convince them to open the School of Life there was a major coup. It's now opened in Paris, Amsterdam, New York. So I work with these guys to actually position how to engage people about some of the amazing things that this organisation does in terms of making people rethink their life, rethink about what's important to them, rethink about the things that they assumed were a given, but perhaps are not. Rethink about the way that they actually thought about what was uh, important to their careers or their, their off time. For example, um, this headline, make your interactions with people transformational, not just transactional. So for us, there wasn't a lot of design to do. This is really about messaging. This is really about communicating some of these core beliefs and the core benefits that you get from engaging with an organisation like this. Old age isn't so bad when you consider the alternative. So in talking about death, in having an event in a cemetery, it's really about, again, recontextualising what the theme means. And these guys are doing amazing things and I strongly suggest get on their website and have a look. They're doing some events in Sydney uh, pretty soon. Sometimes we just do things for no reason. You know, like all of you, we're busy. That's a fact. Anyone in this room who's not busy would surprise me because we're all busy. We've got family lives and business lives and personal lives and it's non-stop and it's overwhelming. It's just a fact. So every once in a while, we just go, well, we're just going to do a project, just because. Are we busy? We're frantic. Do we have time? No. Will it make any money? No. Will it cost money? Yes. <laughs> but you've got to. You know, if you actually want to have a culture that has a sense of revolution about it, you actually just need to create things for no reason. This is that poster up there. Who wants it? Come get it. Um, quick. So this was designed by Nathan Hotton who's sitting up there with his hand up. Nathan did an incredible job of this. No doubt I frustrated the shit out of him through the process. The brief was simple. I want to do a poster about Surrey Hills because our studio is here and I live here and I love the suburb. Just for fun, no reason. And I like doing things about precincts. Uh, of my 14 books, I've done a, um, a book on St Kilda, a book on Collins Street, Melbourne, and a book on Bondi Beach. So I like this notion of engaging communities, about bringing the, the, the sort of fabric of a community to life. So Nathan came back and said, well, actually, I've got a different idea. Instead of about Surrey Hills, why don't we do a poster about the personalities of Sydney suburbs by actually drawing a bike to represent each of those personalities? And I was like, that's a cool idea. So we had a whole bunch of ideas about how these personalities might come to life. And what was it that depicted them? Now, I think there's about 15 on the poster, 12 on the poster. Um, and we kept going, not that suburb, get rid of that suburb, change that suburb, you know, and finicky detail and the words, you know, even the sort of headline, which is um, tour to Sydney, different spokes for different folks. <laughs> Wouldn't it be fun? And what was my brief? My brief was simple. I want people to frame it and put it on their wall in their lounge room. That's the brief. I want people to just love it. I want people to be able to live with it. What's it promoting? Nothing. It's actually not supposed to promote anything. It's about thinking about the collective nature of a city like Sydney and the fact that this city of villages is all unique. So in that uniqueness... <laughs> not all suburbs are equal. Everybody has their own idiosyncrasies, some good, some bad. 
It's all about interpretation. But the reality is, if you talk about revolution in a true sense, you're actually talking about risk. Because you can't have revolution without risk. If revolution was easy, everyone would go out and say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to have this crazy idea. It needs to be meaningful. It needs to have purpose. But you are going to take a risk. And when you take risks, you will fail. It doesn't matter. If you don't try and uh, you're, not, you're not afraid of failing, you know, you'll never actually give it a crack. So I want to show you something that I tried to do in a very corporate commercial environment um, for a building of 60 Martin Place, uh, a very big conservative commercial developer in the city. It's an incredible building, this, this beautiful piece of architecture that actually tiered in. And, and I just thought, this is amazing. I wanted to do something dynamic, dramatic, theatrical, engaging, artistic, fluid. And so with the designers at Hoyne, we developed this idea, which we knew would push boundaries. We knew did not fit into the conservative nature of marketing commercial property worth probably hundreds of millions of dollars. So for us, this little simple video, we just did it in-house. We just used some of the images. You can see the amazing facade of the building, how it cuts in. We wanted to talk about the commercial acumen, the building intelligence, this idea that was very forward-focused, incredible views, but at the same time, an artistic undertone to the entire thing. They hated it. We didn't get the job. It was very disappointing. They said, no, 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 we want something more conservative. We want something that's more consistent with what happens in the market. This is not consistent. This is too different. And uh, you know, losing a job isn't great. Actually, we're quite lucky. We don't lose that many. It's pretty rare. But it's disappointing because we felt passion, belief, and we knew it would work. But we failed. We failed because we wanted to take a revolutionary approach. So be it. If I had to do it all again, would I do it differently? Maybe if I knew to win the job, and then once you've won it, then you try and convince them otherwise. <laughs> but that's the reality. If you're not prepared to fail, you're not prepared to take an open view on what's possible. But the thing is, I actually don't want to talk to you guys about creativity, because I'm not really interested in talking about design in the context of just design. For me, it would not matter if none of you here today were not designers. For me, I just want to talk to people. To people regardless of what job they do. Because the theory remains the same. I don't care whether you're a lawyer or an accountant or a designer. It's irrelevant. If the way that we approach what we do is open-minded and creative, because believe me, the best accountants and lawyers are creative. And the ones who think they're not are not the best accountants and lawyers. You need to actually take an open view in terms of what you believe is possible. So forgetting creativity for a moment. Who here wakes up pretty much every day and bounces out of bed and says, man, this is a good day. Can't wait to get started. I'm rocking. Had a great night's sleep. I feel so good. I feel like Superman. Let's do it. Who, who here does that? How many hands have we got? None? Any? Did I push that too far? Okay, I may have. The reality is that we wake up and we go, shit, fuck, is it morning already? Oh no, oh man, can I just get 15 more minutes? That's the reality. That's the reality we all have. So sometimes we look at people and go, how come they're so up and at them? Well, they woke up the same as you. They had the same experience as you and they've just decided to approach it a bit differently. So the fact is, life's hard. Like we're all busy, we've all got a lot going on. Uh, literally I could pick out any single person from this audience and go, tell me about your life. We go, wow, there's a lot of shit going on in your life. Some of us are pregnant. Some people are changing jobs. Some people have moved cities. Some people have just broken up or getting together. There's all sorts of stuff. But how you deal with that determines the way that you engage with the world. So from my point of view, we have 
exponential potential. So we decide how to use our time. And in the context of this theme of revolution, I believe this is the true revolution. The true revolution is the way that you think about your own life and the way that you want to manage your life, the way that you want to tailor the life to the way that you believe is going to make you happy. It doesn't matter what your job is. It doesn't matter where you live. It's about thinking about the things that you want and how you're going to get them. It could be money. It could be love. It could be where you live. It doesn't matter. You decide your own criteria and it's unique to you. So I started to think about this in the context of me for a moment. Now, my role at Hoyn, so I've had my business for 24 years. We've got about 50 people in the team between three offices. I believe we have got some of the most intelligent, creative, smart, and nice people in our industry in Australia. We've got amazing people. We've got people who are a great cultural fit, who work together well, and who help each other collaboratively. And if you don't, you're in deep trouble. Because as we all know, it only takes one cancerous negative person to fuck things up. So you've got to get rid of those people quickly. Otherwise, you won't have a great environment. It's really that simple. So I think about my role in the business. Now, in my role of the task of, I've got the task of inspiring and energizing staff and clients. So basically firing people up to take creative risks and to do their best work and to bring their energy and passion to the table. So you can only really do that one way in my point of view, and that's actually to inspire them by the way that you do things in your life. So leading by example, it's very simple, but it's true. You know, I hate the notion of when something happens in my life or I do something and I worry about how that affects my team because I think, well, actually, that wasn't really leading by example. And, you know, all the things that I do should lead by example because I want to basically set a benchmark of what we can do together as a unified team. So it's really important to me. I started to think about this notion of all the things that go on in my little world, and I know we all have our own little worlds. You know, I've got to deal with a lot of different personality types. Um, you know, internally, clients, suppliers, you name it. I've got to watch the money. You know, I've, we've got, I've got to watch millions and millions of dollars go here, there and everywhere. It can be quite scary, to be honest. Um, I've got to oversee all the creative work, certainly in Sydney. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of projects that are constantly happening. Um, you know, I do a million meetings. I fly to Melbourne and Brisbane constantly. So really what I'm getting at is not woe is me. We all have the same shit, just different version of it you can feel besieged. You can feel like, okay, so I've got all this stuff. How much did I mention creativity? Maybe about 20% of that little spiel. My point is that when all that stuff comes together, creativity gets pushed less and less and less. So it's actually quite hard to find inspiration within yourself to think creatively when there's all these other things going on. Now that's not an excuse, that's the revolution again. You've got to actually go turn that 20% back to 70 or 80% or just use that 20% as wisely and as intelligently as you possibly can. So there's a few things that I've been doing over the years, and I've been doing it since I started in business. In fact, interestingly, I saw somebody last week uh, who I hadn't seen for about 25 years, and she said, my God, you've been doing this stuff since you're a teenager. You know, your mindset has always been that way inclined. So whilst on one level, this old friend to me said, oh, you haven't really changed. But in my own head, I change every year. And I don't do it just in an evolutionary way. It's got to be revolutionary. You've got to actually review yourself. Don't wait for your 12 months at your job for someone else to tell you what they think of you. You've got to constantly reevaluate yourself, reinvent yourself, rethink yourself. You've got to be tough on yourself, but only because no one else is going to create a life for you that you want except yourself. So the thing that I think about in the context of my family and my team at work is that I can't really inspire anybody unless I inspire myself. So what am I going to do to do that? Well, I have to think about projects. I have to think about, you know, I mean, I like doing books. I've done 14 books, as was said before. These are my last two, Bondi Republic and Cafe Amore. They were a lot of fun. They took up heaps and heaps of time and the money from the sales went to charity because um, that's not really how I make money, so I don't want to make money doing that, but I love doing it. Um, I've got about three or four books that I've, haven't touched for a few years, and I've got two that I'm doing right now, which I'm really excited about. Um, one which is about placemaking and precincts and very much about development and how good it can be around the world. 
uh, and another sort of small, more anecdotal one I won't bore you with now. But the point is, thinking about other things you can do, basically writing your own brief to do things outside your comfort zone, creating your own opportunities and not waiting for someone to give them to you. Some of the things I think about are, you've really got to take a step back and forget the way you do things every day. You've got to be open. You've got to actually think, well, I want to actually find something, so I'm going to go out of my way to look for whatever that is. Now, again, you write your own rules. So in the context of that, you need to explore. Try things. Do things you've not done before. I know, you know, you're not a teenager and you don't get the same opportunity to sort of have that free time. But at the same time, you need to create opportunity. You need to go and do things you haven't done before and find out what you can learn about yourself. And you need to turn what is normally boring, mundane activities into something new. And one of the examples I always think to myself is that when you walk to work, just walk to work a different way. See different things. Make different decisions about basic daily tasks. You'd be surprised how much that impacts you in terms of what you see and how you think. Some of the things that I did was um, I had a really successful business in Melbourne and I went, I'm going to move to Sydney just because I want to try it. And it was incredibly challenging and it revolutionised my entire life. But I'm glad I did it all these years later. It was hell at the time. But that's the thing, you've got to be prepared to take those risks even if there's going to be some short-term hell. You don't look for hell, but you might get hell, just so long as you can overcome it. Um, you know, five years ago I had no kids, now I've got three. Clearly I got on the job. Um, you know, health is really important. You know, I got to a point up and down, fit, not fit, and you know, there's always excuses, I'm too busy, I'm traveling too much, I'm this, I'm that. And at the end, particularly when I had kids, I went, this is bullshit. Forget the excuses. I've got to get on the job and actually take care of myself because it's more than just me now. But you don't have to have kids to feel that. You just should be thinking about you and how you treat yourself. And then finally, a really big thing that I've always faced is this feeling that I could fail. I could fail today, tomorrow, every day. Um, what if this is no good? What if it all falls apart? And you always have these aspirations and desires and you always feel, fuck, it could just blow up in my face. So, you know, and you actually create a structure like a 50 people company. What if no one gives me work tomorrow? But at the same time, you've actually got to look back and go, I know I can do it. I've got the right people. I've got a great method. We've got great processes and I know we can deliver. You've got to back yourself. And my second last thing to talk about is just about being proactive. Don't wait to be asked. If you want to succeed in life, don't wait to be asked. I'm always really impressed when someone comes to me and just goes there and I'm like, whoa. Now, recently um, one of the, the team in Hoyn, Abby, came to me with something completely out of the blue and said, have a look at that. And I went, that is amazing. That's amazing. And I already thought that she was great. But now I think she's incredible because of that one act. And that one act probably took her about two weeks of her own personal time. So it's not about that. It doesn't matter how long it takes. It basically means doing what's not expected. And you're not just doing it to suck up to someone. You're doing it because there's meaning to it, there's purpose, and you're going to actually enjoy that process. And you're going to learn something from it. So don't expect to do stuff proactively and it's going to be perfect. It doesn't matter. It just means that you're having a crack. Lending an ear. You've got to give to get. So engage with the people you work with. Talk to them. Don't sit at your computer with your headphones and forget the person next to you. It's lazy. I know you all say, oh, I'm really busy and I'm focused. That's great. Be busy and focused. That's great. But know when to engage. Know when to talk to people. Know when to find out about their life. Waking up. Well, my view is that if you start early, you get a shitload more done. Now, it's easy for me to say because I start early because I've got three kids and it's the way that I live my life. But if you avoid watching a bunch of TV, if you literally cut your TV down to near zero and you got up early, you could all write a novel this year. You could all, that golden plan that you've always had for the last 20 years in your life, you do it in one year. One year. No TV, wake up early. Sounds simple, isn't it? I'd love to think that one of you will do that this year. So to help you, I'm going to give you some examples of a few books that you should read. Whatever you think, Think the Opposite by Paul Arden. An incredible book, an absolute inspiration. Very skinny, even a designer could read this. Uh, not so many words. And what you'll really love about it, 
Lots of some big words too. So. <laughs> the other one that I think is great and a real inspiration is it's not how good you are, it's how good you want to be. Now, I live by this book because I've always believed I'm not that good. But fuck, I try hard and I persevere and I want to be good. And I'm not there yet, but God damn, I'm going to get there. The other thing to think about, again, by Alain de Botton, the pleasures and sorrows of work. It's what you make it. It's like all the things in your life. You decide whether it's a happy time or a shit time. If you want to revolutionise your life, be inspired by books like this to rethink what goes on and the decisions that you make. If you have got a shit time at work or home, it's completely based on the decisions that you're making, even if someone's being a negative influence. You need to rethink that stuff and create your own environment. The School of Life, the book, is a great book. They've got several. I strongly recommend reading these. They're, you know, they'll really open your mind to how you see the way that you live. And then finally, the jobs that we do, we all want to be paid more money. More money leads to more holidays, nicer clothes, better cars. It's true. Money is really important. But never let money be the driver. Money is an outcome. Focus on passion and you'll get money. And finally, the most important thing for me about revolution, it's not the pointy end. It's not this sort of magical thing. It's not a ta-da moment. It's not finally I got to revolution. I did this one little thing. For me, it's about a holistic approach to your life. It's about the way you think about who you want to be, how you want to be perceived, and how you're going to make yourself happy. That is true revolution. Thank you.